During the 1960s, students were protesting the Vietnam War on college campuses throughout the nation. It was no different at the University of Arkansas. Here on the university campus, Clinton would climb into a tree where he would place a mattress and spend days on end to declare his own protest against the war. People in Fayetteville still recall walking a block out of their way just to avoid the strong stench that came from the ground below Clinton. The fire department showed up on at least one occasion to wash the ground below the tree and even gave young Clinton unwanted free showers with their hoses. A photo of Clinton in the tree made the school newspaper, but all known copies of that particular edition have since been confiscated or destroyed. Mr. Clinton studied at Oxford in England. Most of his professors there described themselves as Marxist-Leninists or socialists. In early 1969, Clinton was called to London for a physical examination and was classified 1A, which meant Vietnam. Upon his return to Arkansas, Clinton drove to Fayetteville to the home of Colonel Eugene Holmes, commander of the Army ROTC unit at the University of Arkansas, where he begged to join the program. Clinton signed a letter of intent and gave a pledge to enter the university law school. In the fall, he returned to Oxford where he would help organize demonstrations against the United States outside the American Embassy. On December 2, 1969, in violation of his promise to enroll in the ROTC program, he applied to Yale Law School. On December 3rd, he wrote a letter to Colonel Holmes stating, quote, Because of my opposition to the draft and the war, I have great sympathy with those who are not willing to fight, kill, and maybe die for their country." Unquote. Mr. Clinton was described as a moocher and with no apparent income. Yet he left England for a 40-day trip to Scandinavia, the Soviet Union, and Czechoslovakia. Clinton stayed at one of Moscow's most exclusive hotels, the National. Clinton went on to Prague, where he stayed with Oxford friend John Kopold's parents, who were leaders in the Communist Party. The grandfather was a founder of the Czech Communist Party and a member of the party's central committee. In fact, communist Czechoslovakia had been a training area for international terrorists. Shortly after Clinton's return to America, his friend Jan Kapold died mysteriously when he fell from the upper floors of a derelict building in circumstances that were unclear. Another close Clinton friend and a fellow draft dodger at Oxford was Frank Aller. When he returned to Spokane, Washington, he was found shot to death in September 1971. His death was ruled a suicide. At Yale Law School in 1970, Hillary Rodham helped found the Yale Review of Law and Social Action. The second issue devoted 50 pages to the murder trial of Black Panther Lonnie McLucas. Some of the illustrations depict policemen as pigs. One drawing shows a decapitated and dismembered pig squealing in agony. And another one described them as, quote, a low-natured beast that has no regard for law, justice, or the rights of people. A creature that bites the hand that feeds it. A foul, depraved traducer usually found masquerading as the victim of an unprovoked attack." Unquote. Other articles encouraged experimentation with drugs, sex, and individual lifestyles. In Bill Clinton's Arkansas, some two million people remained among the poorest in the nation. Their average yearly income was less than the $20,000 annual fees at the Little Rock Country Club. Arkansas families earning less than $9,000 a year paid nearly four times more state tax proportionately than families making in excess of $600,000. Arkansas remained almost last in the United States in per capita expenditure for education, 
in the percentage of its students completing high school and the proportion of its citizens with college degrees. Nowhere in America is the range so great as in Arkansas, wrote the Arkansas Times in 1992, from the multi-billionaire status of the Walmart Waltons to the abject poverty of the Delta region, where Lee County is listed as one of the ten poorest counties in the entire nation. Infant mortality there is twice the national average, and two-thirds of all children never graduate from high school. In the aftermath of his 1980 election defeat, Bill Clinton began appearing every Sunday at Emanuel Baptist Church, which he had never attended so regularly before. He was now seen prominently in the choir, as carefully arranged television cameras carried the service to thousands of viewers throughout the state. A convicted drug dealer and informant named Charlene Wilson testified to a 1990 federal grand jury in Arkansas that she had attended parties in which she watched as Roger Clinton passed cocaine to his brother Bill. On one occasion, Clinton got so high on cocaine that he fell into a garbage can. She also testified that the people would share sex partners and some of the women included teenage girls. In 1983-84, local narcotics officers videotaped Bill Clinton's brother Roger, saying, quote, got to get some for my brother. He's got a nose like a vacuum cleaner, unquote. Throughout the 1980s, the Clintons would enjoy relative impunity from the scrutiny of investigative journalism. The rare independent journalist was soon made an example. Publisher Gene Wurgis tried to expose ballot box stuffing and other corruption through the 1960s and 1970s and was lucky to survive nearly a dozen attempts on his life. He was indicted seven times on trumped-up charges ranging from slander to conspiracy and was once sentenced to three years at hard labor only to be saved when the main prosecution witness was proven to have lied. In 1978, in Clinton's first run for governor, a retired Air Force lieutenant colonel named Bill Guerin accused Clinton of being a draft dodger by reneging on his 1969 ROTC commitment. Clinton, thinking his letter to Colonel Holmes had long since been destroyed, insisted that the ROTC agreement was canceled shortly after it was made. He said he told Colonel Holmes that he would enter the ROTC program if the commander wanted him to, but he preferred to take his chances with the draft. However, the colonel would tell a different story. In September 1992, Colonel Eugene Holmes, himself a lifelong Democrat, made a final statement on the episode and presented Clinton's letter to the press. He stated that Clinton, quote, purposely deceived me using the possibility of joining the ROTC as a ploy, purposely defrauding the military, both in concealing his anti-military activities overseas and his counterfeit intentions for later military service, unquote. It was in this setting that Bill Clinton entered state politics in 1975. When he left in 1991, he had been governor for 12 years. What he had done in and for Arkansas, he claimed, qualified him to govern the nation. From Clinton's first years as Attorney General, Little Rock had been awash in gossip about his blatant womanizing. After he was elected president, Arkansas trooper, bodyguards, and others would testify to his extramarital relations with literally hundreds of women. State trooper L.D. Brown stated that on state time and using state cars, he drove the governor to over 100 extramarital affairs and guarded him during those encounters. Brown was Clinton's favorite trooper, and he received dozens of books from the governor, many of which he still retains. In one law book, there's a sentence to the effect that adultery is not a crime and is underlined twice in red. Larry Patterson was an Arkansas state trooper for 31 years and a personal bodyguard for then-Governor Clinton for six years. More than once, Patterson said, 
he stood guard and witnessed the department store clerk performing oral sex on Governor Clinton in a parked car, including the parking lot of Chelsea's elementary school and on the grounds of the governor's mansion. It was probably the most bizarre time I've spent in my tenure with the state police. I was required to, to go out into the audiences to get women's telephone numbers, their names for him, to block streets, to sit in women's driveways till the wee hours of three and four, five o'clock in the morning uh, at their apartment complexes. Uh, that's what I was required to do. That was just part of the job. I was told when I protested about that that uh, if I didn't like it, I'd find another job. Did you feel soiled? Did you feel uh, in any way um, disdain for this man that you were assigned to risk, quite frankly, your life for? But your job did not uh, turn out to be saving his life or protecting him. Uh, you, quite frankly, uh, turned out to be someone assigned to procure. It's a pimp. I didn't want to use that word, but how did, how did that make you feel? Well, you know, it was real easy to, you know, to get caught up in all the hoopla at first. But after a while, after you saw the way he treated people, you know, that's not the, the way that I was taught. It was not the standards that, that I was raised by. And it, it, it bothered me a lot. And, and to the point where I talked to my supervisors about it, I talked to the director of the state police about it. And I was told, yeah, that's part of your job. In fact, Bill Clinton told me one time, he said, Larry, you may be required to lie, to steal, to kill, to protect me, to cover me. Was his words. On yet another occasion, the governor arrived at the Little Rock Airport. Clinton told his bodyguards that he was going to be driven back to the residence by the Arkansas lawyer who had met the plane so that she could show him her new Jaguar. On the ride back, he drove and she was nowhere to be seen in the car. He later told Trooper Patterson that he had researched the subject in the Bible and oral sex isn't considered adultery. George Grieg of the London Sunday Times wrote, quote, what has emerged is a man with what would appear to be an almost psychotic inability to control his zipper." Unquote. The repeated testimony of state troopers would show that Clinton rated women as objects, ripe peaches as he called them, purely to be graded, chased, dominated, and conquered. The governor had been predatory even toward one of the troopers' wives and toward another's mother-in-law. Neither then nor later did many of those around Clinton reflect on the deeper meaning of the womanizing and what it said about other aspects of the man and leader. No fewer than four Arkansas State Troopers, including two past presidents of the Arkansas State Troopers Association, have now provided detailed accounts of attempts to silence them because of their knowledge about Clinton's affairs with unmerited career promotions and job offers. Federal jobs was offered by Bill Clinton when Roger Perry and Danny Ferguson and Ronnie Anderson and I first came forward. If we would uh, keep quiet, not say anything, that we could have U.S. Marshals jobs, that we could have FEMA director jobs, if we would just keep our mouth shut. As Bill Clinton's presidential campaign got underway, some of the troopers were considering coming forward. The commander of Clinton's security detail then threatened Roger Perry and other troopers on behalf of the President of the United States. He said the troopers' reputations would be destroyed and that they themselves would be destroyed. Larry Patterson even received a handwritten note expressing concern about his health. Larry, did you um, fear Bill Clinton? Personally, no, I, I did not. Uh, after, you know, after I got to know the man, you know, if it came to a confrontation between a, a policeman and Bill Clinton, Bill Clinton would always back down. No, I was not physically afraid of Bill Clinton. I was afraid of his power. Larry, were you afraid of Bill Clinton's friends? You betcha. 
you betcha. He had some uh, some uh, people that uh, that was quite scary. Yes. Away from the public spotlight, both Bill and, to a greater extent, Hillary, were contemptuous of policemen, whom they commonly derided as ignorant SOBs, says Trooper Brown. In 1984, Brown accompanied Clinton to a funeral for a state trooper who had been killed by a survivalist in rural Dequeen. Brown and Clinton went into a banquet room, where hundreds of mourning policemen from Arkansas, Texas, and Louisiana were eating. According to Brown, Clinton said, quote, I don't want to go in and eat with those ignorant SOBs. Let's go to another room, unquote. Hillary was openly hostile, calling them pigs. One trooper said that Hillary forbade him to speak when he accompanied her on a trip to Washington because, as she put it, he, quote, sounded like a hick from Arkansas, unquote. Another officer said, quote, Deep down, that woman really hated Arkansas, the people in it, and almost everything else except being top dog, unquote. Troopers volunteered to work several days of consecutive 16-hour shifts just to avoid traveling with her. After becoming president, her attitude remained the same. A Secret Service agent was quoted as saying it was obvious that she had a clear dislike for the agents, bordering on hatred, in his opinion. On another occasion, Secret Service agents heard Hillary's daughter Chelsea refer to them as personal trained pigs to some of her friends. One of the agents explained to her that he was willing to put his life on the line to save hers, and he believed that her father, the president, would be shocked if he heard what she just said to her friends. Chelsea's response was, I don't think so. That's what my parents call you. 